start with my opening comments and uh, and we'll hopefully Mr. Bell will be here shortly. So good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the Joint Assembly Transportation and Senate Transportation and Housing Committee Oversight Hearing. Today we'll be looking at ARB programs that re relate to transportation. There's Mr. Bell now. Thank you, sir. The purpose of today's hearing is oversight. We've given ARB a lot of authority over the years, first for clean air mandates and more recently for climate change. Given that this year is the 10th anniversary of the passage of AB 32, we figured it would be a good time to have an ARB come in, have ARB come in and tell us about their programs that relate to transportation. And it's a lot of programs, nearly 50 of them. So what we're going to do today is learn about more about these programs, what they are designed to accomplish, how much we're spending on them, and most importantly, are they working? Are we getting the air quality and greenhouse gas reduction benefits we had hoped for, and at what cost? These are important questions, and it's the legislature's job to do this sort of oversight. We're spending a lot of money on these programs, and we're asking a lot of folks to spend a lot of time and money complying with these regulations. You know, and that's a good thing, because it's given us cleaner, healthier air and addressing climate change. We need clean air, but we also need a healthy, vibrant economy. And I don't think the two are mutually exclusive if we do things right. The committee staff worked with ARB to put together a matrix covering all of ARB's transportation-related programs. This matrix was handed out to members in their packets and was included in the background paper. We'll be working off that matrix today. The nearly 50 regulatory and incentive programs I talked about earlier are broken down into six major categories on the matrix. Obviously, we don't have time to talk about every single program in depth today, so what we're going to do is this. First, we're going to have the LAO come up and give us some background on ARB and its programs. Then we'll have ARB representatives come up and come up and we'll bring the discussion back up here to the dais and ask ARB about some of the major program uh, categories and then about some of the individual excuse me, about some of the individual regulatory and incentive programs within those broader categories. Senator Bell and I will pose some of the major questions to ARB to get us going, but we want to encourage members to ask questions and dig in. We want this to be a very infor informative dialogue. We need to be somewhat mindful of time, however, because there's a lot of programs here. Also, I want to remind everyone in the audience that this is, will be a broad overview, and we do intend to go into more depth at future hearings on many of these programs. For those of you here from stakeholder groups, I know many of you wanted to play a role in today's hearing. Rest assured that we will make cert certainty that do that uh, tongue tied. Make sure that we have uh, certainty do future hearings on we will do future hearings on individual regulatory and incentive programs. At this time we will seek out to provide more formal input. At this hearing, although Please feel free to use the public comment period at the end to weigh in what you feel needs to be added. I heard from ARB this morning that you disagree with our background papers and matrix. Presumably, the characterization that the data were not available. First, I acknowledge that all staff involved in putting hearing mater materials together have worked long and hard to compile this information. I also acknowledge that there may very well be a disconnect between the data we have asked for and the way the ARB evaluates its own program. Clearly, however, my staff and Senator Bell's staff are not alone in our frustration. The Senate Budget Committee's hearing last week on cap and trade repeatedly got into the very same points we have made. That is a frustration that we have been, a, been a, unable to assess, assess the effectiveness of nearly 50 ARB programs and unable to determine if the benefits of the programs are in line with the cost to achieve those benefits. So to ARB as we begin today, feel free to clarify any information you feel has been reported in error, but let me restate one more time. We are asking, and, I, and I'd like to clear, 
and I'd like a clear and direct responses in return. So, so what we are asking, please be clear with your direct response. So this is what we're looking for. What is the specific goal of the program? How do we measure the success of the program? Where are to date we, where are we to date with respect to meeting the goal of the program? How is the program funded? And how much money has been spent to date on the program? As you share this information with us today, we will be happy to update the matrix to reflect your comments and then make the matrix publicly available. Clearly, the legislature supports clean air and climate change goals, but we also, have, also need to be sure ARB is held accountable to how the nearly $1 billion is spent annually. So let's get started today. This hearing is meant to be a dialogue. It's all about getting the information the legislature needs to make decisions. This, is, this isn't a us versus them. It's about working together, spending money wisely, and accomplishing our clean air and climate goals together. Before we begin, let me turn the hearing over to Senator Bell to say a few words. Thank you, Senator Bell. I appreciate uh, all the work done by uh, Chair Frazier's uh, staff himself and uh, the summary, so I will be brief, okay? Um, we um, appreciate also the ARB staff uh, in terms of producing the information we have in front of us today. The fact that it took so much work to compile the information uh, tells me perhaps we are overdue in taking a look at these programs. Uh, I recall when I chaired the budget subcommittee uh, on um, transportation environment, we, we talked about this issue two years ago and, and Actually, I think we allocated some money for research and development, uh, but I want to find out um, how we can do the research and development in a more comprehensive way so the legislator can get all the information it needs to make uh, decisions uh, that benefit uh, our communities. Um, I, I wanted to say that I reiterate Chair Fraser's um, Goal that this hearing is to understand how the state money has been invested and whether we need to make any changes in how we're spending the dollars. And are these programs achieving the goals we originally set out to achieve? If no, what do we need to do to get there? Is it time to shut down some programs and redirect uh, monies elsewhere? I don't know. Another question has risen um, in preparation of this hearing is whether or not we uh, set up these programs to measure results. Um, if not, we need to get work with uh, ARB and um, establish um, how to do that moving forward to ensure we get the most bang for our buck. And I look forward to a protect, uh, productive hearing today. And um, Chair Frazier, I'll turn it over to you. We can start the hearing. Let's get going. Thank you, Senator Bell, and again, welcome to the Little House. <laughs> Just kidding. So um, what I'd like to do now is bring up uh, Ross Brown up to the, uh, to start the uh, process going forward and give us his information going forward. Thank you, sir, for coming. Thank you, chairs and members. Ross Brown with the Legislative Analyst Office. Um, we have been asked by the committee today to provide just a brief high-level introduction to some of the key laws um, and planning efforts that guides AR guide ARB's uh, transportation-related emissions programs, including regulations and incentive programs. Uh, we did put together a very short handout uh, that some of you may already have, but if not, uh, the sergeants are, uh, are passing that handout around, so I'll wait for just one brief moment before I get into it.
So um, as the chairs mentioned, you'll hear a lot from ARB about their particular programs and their particular regulations. I think um, our goal is to just provide uh, some high level context for some of those programs. And what we start with on page one is just a look at some of the key emission reduction laws that uh, provide the authority and guide ARB's emission reduction programs. Uh, the first is uh, the first page on the handout is related to uh, laws guiding criteria pollutant reductions, and so uh, we'll make a distinction between some of the criteria pollutant reduction laws and the greenhouse gas emission reduction laws. Uh, perhaps one of the key laws guiding ARB's criteria pollutant activities is the Federal Clean Air Act, which uh, requires the U.S. EPA to establish national air quality standards for certain common pollutants known as criteria pollutants, uh, such as ozone and particulate matter. Uh, the ARB in California is responsible for regulating uh, mobile sources of criteria pollutants, and local air districts are primarily responsible for stationary sources. Uh, as many of you, I'm sure, are well aware, there are certain parts of the state that uh, struggle to meet those federal air quality standards, and the air quality standards become uh, more stringent in future years. There's also a state, uh, California Clean Air Act, which uh, establishes state air quality standards. Uh, when it was first implemented, uh, it's our understanding that the state standards were uh, generally more stringent than the federal standards. However, in recent years, uh, those standards are, are more aligned now, and a lot of ARB's uh, emission reduction activities and planning efforts are, uh, are aimed at achieving those federal standards because there are some federal penalties associated with not meeting those standards. Uh, I do want to note before I move on to the next page, uh, there's also a body of law related to toxic air contaminants, and perhaps the, the most relevant one for a lot of ARB's uh, activities is diesel particulate matter, and so there's uh, an area of state law that directs uh, ARB to identify toxic uh, air contaminants and develop a plan for reducing those contaminants. So page two of your handout, we uh, provide a... A uh, summary of some of the key laws related to greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, and the major one, of course, is AB 32, which was passed in 2006, which established a statewide greenhouse gas emission reduction target to, uh, uh, to hit the target of the meeting 19, 1990 levels of greenhouse gases by 2020. Um, there's also a couple of other areas of law that direct uh, specific activities related to vehicle efficiency standards and light-duty vehicles, also known as uh, PAVLI standards, uh, as well as SB 375, which directed ARB to establish GHG reduction targets for certain uh, areas of the state and directed uh, transportation planning organizations to develop plans for meeting those uh, reduction targets through uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled. Page three of your handout, uh, we really shift into just a very brief discussion of some of the administration's goals, for especially, especially for greenhouse gas reductions. Um, the, uh, the governor, through a couple of executive orders, has established both 2030 and 2050 greenhouse gas reduction targets. Uh, the admin, uh, 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2030 and 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050. Uh, in addition, through some of the administration's planning documents and planning efforts, uh, the governor has established a so-called five pillars strategy for helping meet those 20, 2030 greenhouse gas emission targets. Um, as it relates to the transportation sector, one of those five pillars is a 50% reduction in petroleum use by 2030. Uh, important, uh, we think, to keep in mind that page three and the, these long-term and mid-term GHG reduction targets are administration goals. Um, the primary body of law related to greenhouse gas emissions in the state and the statutory direction is in AB 32, which is, establishes the 2020 GHG target. And so important to keep in mind as you hear from uh, the administration what extent are their activities being driven by goals that are set by the administration versus uh, what the state statute directs them to do. Page four, we uh, provide a summary of a few of the major planning activities that ARB conducts uh, in an effort to achieve these various air quality and GHG targets. The first uh, is the state implementation plan, which is part of the federal process for achieving federal air quality standards, and ARB uh, takes the lead on developing that plan, particularly as it relates to mobile sources of emissions. 
Um, in 2015, the ARB released a draft mobile source strategy, uh, which put together a strategy and a plan for achieving uh, some of the mobile emission reduction activities needed to meet uh, federal air quality standards. Uh, that document also incorporated some of the administration's goals related to long-term greenhouse gases and petroleum reduction. Uh, the AB 32 scoping plan on the greenhouse gas side of things is the uh, primary planning document for achieving the state's greenhouse gas targets. The original scoping plan was developed in 2008. There was an update in 2014. Uh, the ARB is currently working on another update for that plan in response to uh, an administration executive order to develop and update a, a new scoping plan to achieve the administration's 2030 greenhouse gas targets. And the final planning effort I just want to touch on is on page five, which is the sustainable freight for strategy, which again is in response to a, an executive order. Uh, the strategy must establish clear targets to improve freight efficiency and increase competitiveness of California's freight system. Uh, the ARB released a, a discussion document uh, in 2015 and has been conducting public workshops in, in recent weeks. Um, before I turn it over to ARB, and I'm sure you all have lots of questions for them about their particular programs. I did want to provide just a few brief comments and questions that we think you might uh, uh, want to ask them or consider as you hear from them related to their programs. And many of them, actually, the, the chairs uh, both touched on in their, in their opening comments. Uh, the first is this issue of to what extent are their activities and planning activities consistent with legislative direction and to what extent are they based on uh, the administration's goals. And so that's an important question we think for you to ask them um, to ensure that their activities are being conducted in a way that's consistent with legislative priorities. Second uh, is how does ARB evaluate whether their pol policies are achieving the greatest benefits or achieving those uh, goals in the most cost-effective way? Um, and there's two sort of important areas we think to think about. And one is up front, before the programs, regulations, and incentives are implemented, what type of analysis goes into the assessment of which mix of policies and programs is likely to achieve the uh, state's goals in the most cost-effective way? And how is that information made available? And how is that analysis conducted? And perhaps as importantly, I think, is uh, what type of structure is set up once those programs are implemented to, uh, to evaluate them as they're being implemented and after they're implemented to determine the degree to which they're successful? And how can, how can that information make its way back to the legislature in order to inform its future decisions about the, the state of the programs and how well they're operating as it moves forward with additional policy? So with that, I will, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I know ARB uh, will be up here to answer a lot of the specific questions that you have about their specific programs. Senator Bell, you have any questions of Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, kind of questions I have um, relate to financing and getting uh, the maximum dollar return to the state of California from the federal government. Okay, um, when I read your report, um, I looked at uh, the funding sources, and generally in transportation area, uh, it's a combination of funds for projects, federal, state, and local, okay? The federal government uh, on transportation projects generally requires to have um, certain criteria that show a benefit, and they have a set of criteria for various projects, freight goods movement, highways, uh, tra especially transit. Very competitive environment. We could lose money by, by not being competitive. Uh, so the question would be, given the fact that we have to be competitive to get these funds, um, how do we, how do we uh, set our performance measurements to be compatible with what's now law in the federal government uh, to maximize the return to the state of California to finance all the infrastructure transportation needs using this resource? That would be the question. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, if I'm understanding sort of the question correctly, I mean, a lot of that has to do with sort of the state's overall strategy for transportation funding activities. Um, to be 
perfectly honest. Uh, I'm most familiar with sort of the ARB's regulatory activities and some of the, the programs that they operate to provide incentives. Um, so I, I might have to sort of get back to you on the question of sort of incorporating uh, some of the criteria that we're going to be talking about today into transportation planning development and, and working through the federal government. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah, this is the Transportation Committee, so I've got to ask those kind of questions right, I, for my members. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, because I think all of us want the money quick and we want the money now because we would like to eliminate congestion, reduce pollution as soon as possible. So. So there's various programs the federal government has uh, that accomplish that, and we want to maximize the return to the state of California in those competitive programs that the federal government has for, for transportation. Mr. Chairman, I think that what our committee should work together on that and try to uh, evaluate that more f closely so that we can, uh, we all agree that, you know, I'm pretty much uh, that we should get we need more investment in transportation in, in the state of California. Any other questions of the committee? Mr. Wiskowski? When the airport uh, reviews the SIP, um, they are actually approved the local air quality uh, uh, districts plan on stationary sources. Can you give me some idea of how that works? Because we We've, we've got this criteria, and we're looking for these federal numbers that we want to achieve, and we know San Joaquin and Raleigh aren't achieving those. How does that trade-off between mobile sources and stationary sources work, and then how does it get approved? I mean, I, I think that's a good question and, and probably best answered by ARB. They could give you a lot more detail on how it works. I mean, our, our just at a very high level... Uh, we know the ARB works with the local air districts to identify sort of what those targets are. Um, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure sort of how they develop what portion of those emission reductions need to come from mobile sources and what portion come from stationary sources and how they make that calculation. I think that's an um, important and, and a good question for ARB when they, when they come up. Sure. Mr. Brown, uh, so how would you expect ARB to collect the data for their programs, is there any statutory requirement uh, that actually how program data should be collected and, and shared? Um, I mean, um, I think it, it might depend on sort of a program by program basis. Uh, I mean, a lot of our uh, recent analysis has been on the, the greenhouse gas reduction side and has been looking at uh, information that's available on spending on greenhouse gas emission reduction programs, and there are some requirements that are in statute to try and provide that information. However, on some of the regulatory programs, uh, I'm not aware of, um, of many sort of statutory requirements to provide that information, at least in a way that's digestible to, to the legislature right now. Um, but I would, uh, again, like to hear from ARB on sort of if there are those types of requirements in statute, um, what type of information is currently being collected from them, and uh, in what way can that information sort of find its way back to the legislature so you all can help, can can make informed decisions about the effectiveness of the programs? Just one other question. Um, so acknowledging that we went through probably one of the worst recessions in any of our uh, memory, was there any kind of analysis done by your agency that recognized that goals were set before uh, the recession occurred and how you know, devastating it has been to some of the industries going forward. Is there a, a kind of a reset button that could have been, have you guys looked at that as far as when goals are set and then when an economy is affected that can't or won't be able to achieve, then should there be a reset going forward? We, we haven't conducted a, a specific analysis on that issue. I think one area where we have put some thought into thinking about that question is on AB 32 related programs, in particular the cap and trade program, uh, which establishes an overall cap. Um, if economic conditions take a downturn, then meeting that overall cap becomes uh, a, little, a little bit easier in some ways. I mean, it's a problem, of course, because of the economic conditions, but the cap that's established becomes a little less stringent because economic activity slows down and emissions might slow down. But uh, when it comes to other regulations and uh, vehicle-specific regulations and those types of things, it's not an area that we've uh, conducted an analysis of yet. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
Any other questions from the committee, Mr. Brown? Mr. Brown, thank you very much. Thank you. Very informative. So now I'd like to ask Executive Director Corey and other representatives from our ARB to come forward. So thank you, Mr. Corey and Associates, for being here. Uh, let's go ahead and get started on this. Understood. So, so just so the public knows that the Senate is in session at 2 o'clock, and some of the senators have had to go uh, attend roll call. So anyway, we'll continue. And thank you, Senator Bell, for staying as long as you can. As, as we mentioned, we want this to be a question and answer format. So let's start on the light duty uh, vehicle sector programs, Mr. Corey. Uh, Mr. Corey, can you please tell us the purpose of the light duty vehicle program? Uh, absolutely, uh, Chair. I had some context, but if you prefer straight to questions. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and I did want to make sure that you're aware that I brought my executive team because we do run a number of programs. And depending on the particular program, I'll be drawing on my uh, team here. But I, uh, one broad context question, and right, right to your response. And that is, I heard a number of comments with respect to climate program. And the gentleman from LAO was talking about climate program and climate related responsibilities. I think it's critical to point out that ARB's historical mission, and really its continuing mission for an agency that's been in existence about 50 years, is healthy air quality, dealing with toxics, and climate. And we also find that many of the strategies, particularly the mobile source strategies, many of them get to a trip, what I call triple play. They reduce GHGs, they reduce NOx that forms ozone, in some cases they reduce diesel particulate matter. But now I'm going to have uh, Dr. I Alberto Ayala, who oversees our mobile source program, get into some detail in terms of your question. So we're going to be specifically yes. asking about the light duty vehicle program and, and keeping on topic. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for the opportunity. So um, the light duty program. Light duty vehicle control started in California 50 years ago and now is spread all over the world. So the light duty program really is at the core of the agency's uh, priorities. What we essentially do is a multi-pronged control program where first and foremost at the heart of the program is establishing uh, emission standards for passenger cars and other light duty vehicles. That is the uh, the core strategy to control emissions. And as I mentioned uh, to you, this is really the first policy that the state put in place even before there was a federal EPA. And over the years, the program has undergone uh, three major revisions. And the reason the focus was on light duty is not because on a per car basis they emit a lot of pollution, it's because we have so many cars on our roads. That was really the initial focus why we, we started controlling them. It was also the recognition that car emissions are indeed the precursors for ambient smog. California made that determination long ago, and that really is what set us on this path. Um, in terms of uh, 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 the control program, when, when you talk about light duty program, uh, the first uh, 30 years or so of the program were focusing on criteria emissions, ozone precursors, um, particular matter, some of the other criteria emissions. Since the AB 1493 and the Pavley regulation came into place, we began also looking at light duty uh, uh, sources for greenhouse gas emission control. And where we are today, we like to talk about in terms of an integrated uh, comprehensive program where we're looking at the same source. We're looking at combustion as a source of criteria and greenhouse gas emissions. So we are controlling uh, these emissions in a, in a coordinated fashion. We're looking at the nexus of both criteria and greenhouse gas emissions. And what you have today is essentially on a per car basis 
uh, emissions that are, you know, more than 90 percent lower than they used to be 30, 40 years ago when we started. And again, that is at the core of, of, our, of our policies for clean air. Now, surrounding the emission standards are a number of programs that the state uh, has put in place. One of the strategies that you have in your matrix is OBD, onboard diagnostics. Again, that is a complementary policy that was invented in California, that was deployed in California first and foremost, and it's again, is a means for us to make sure that we're ensuring the emission reductions that we're expecting from the car emission standards. So this is getting right at the heart of what the committee is interested in. We have other policies. For example, the state has smog check, inspection and maintenance program that is, again, precisely and, and specifically meant so that we can track progress, so that when we put in place emission standards and other requirements on the cars that come to California, the state also has other means to make sure that we're tracking uh, the emission benefits that we're expecting. 